Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight to help us present this year's NatureServe Conservation Award to Walt Reed. Each year since 2010, we've presented the NatureServe Conservation Award to honor individual achievements that contribute to conservation of biological diversity. This award explicitly recognizes recipients who significantly increase the public profile of the importance of biodiversity conservation, who pursue innovative and creative approaches to biodiversity conservation, and set examples for others in their use of biodiversity information to help make decisions. And finally, perhaps most importantly, by inspiring others to take action in conserving biodiversity. The award recipient is selected by a committee comprised of NatureServe staff, members of our board of directors, uh, network representatives from, from across the NatureServe network, and previous recipients of the uh, past awards. And some of our other recipients have included Bob Jenkins, the Natural Heritage Methodology founder and, and father of our NatureServe network, eminent biologist and author and visionary voice for biodiversity conservation, E.O. Wilson, and most recently, Bill Ruckelshaus, the first administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Deputary, Deputy Attorney General of the uh, U.S. Um, and a tireless advocate for environmental protection. So tonight we add Walt Reed to this illustrious group. And I'd like to offer a few quick thoughts on why Walt was selected. As director of the conservation science program at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, Walt leads efforts to invest in action and ideas that conserve and restore ecosystems while enhancing human well-being. In addition to the usual focus on public policy and private sector practices, Walt's program actually plays a very critical role in supporting scientific efforts to develop essential knowledge and tools that address cons uh, biodiversity conservation challenges. And that's a focus that we all can appreciate at NatureServe because it is in strong alignment with our mission as well. He's also made a major contribution to the field of biodiversity conservation through his previous work regionally as the coordinator of the Puget Sound Salmon Collaboration. That was a group of environmental and business leaders that recommended actions to conserve those threatened species, threatened salmon species, and also nationally as a member of the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Working Group of the President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. You may recognize that as the PCAST report. But even more than all these wonderful contributions, Walt earned this award because of his work in the development of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. The impact of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that it, that's had on conservation practice is absolutely enormous. The landmark report is unique for its consensus-driven process that brought together more than a thousand scientific experts and additional leaders, many more leaders from the public and private sector with the goal of providing scientific guidance for meaningful policy changes that could conserve the world's ecosystems. I'd like to highlight three ways in which uh, that report has had lasting impact on the work of NatureServe. First, as a broad and accessible report on the status and trends of ecosystems, it raised awareness of the plight of the Earth's ecosystems and the services that they provide. This reached a massive new audience of government and business leaders that previously hadn't really been addressing ecosystems in this way. The assessment made it possible to start the conversation with thousands of people whose activities uh, impact and depend on the quality of the Earth's green infrastructure and enabled us to draw more direct connections between our own ecological work and the day-to-day -day concerns of many sectors of society. 
Second, the assessment was created, or it created the framework and vocabulary for the concept of ecosystem services, particularly through its explicit emphasis on the idea of beneficiaries, people who benefit from the ecosystem services. That made it possible for us to connect our understanding of the status and trends of ecosystems to the well-being of human communities at every, every step of the way. The assessment provided the foundation on which organizations like NatureServe have been able to build to advance this really booming area of study over the last decade. And our ecologists have already been working, who had, who had already been working, to articulate the condition of ecosystems and their ability to support biodiversity and other public values so that the assessment made it possible for us to communicate more effectively with these new audiences about how this knowledge that we were developing could help them achieve their own sustainability objectives. And finally, the assessment established the feasibility of evaluating conservation status of ecological systems worldwide. Once again, not only is this in line with the nature serves existing approaches to developing conservation science to guide effective ac conservation action. But it also set the stage for the present effort that we have with the IUCN for the Red List of Ecosystems, spearheaded by our network colleague from Venezuela, John Paul Rodriguez, along with NatureServe's team of ecological experts led by Pat Comer, and of course, uh, for the, the hemisphere-wide work, Carmen Joss. And this is to develop the specific global characterizations that help us understand ecosystem status and trends in the Americas. As you might expect, Walt's current employers from the Packard Foundation are delighted to know that Walt is being honored tonight. And they sent along a few words, which I'd like to read, uh, because they wanted to uh, acknowledge your work as well, Walt. So uh, on behalf of the trustees, and staff of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, we write to express our heartfelt congratulations to Walt Reed as the recipient of NatureServe's Conservation Awards. Walt's deep expertise, passionate commitment as a scientist and an advocate for biodiversity and conservation of the Earth's resources and systems have already led to decades of singular contribution. We have been honored and fortunate to have him on our conservation, uh, leading our conservation and science efforts since 2006. And we're sorry that we cannot join uh, on you on April 16 as you honor Walt to gather and gather for this annual conference for biodiversity without boundaries. We will be applauding him from afar. Many thanks to NatureServe and the sponsors of this award and conference. And Walt, we look forward to your ongoing leadership on behalf of the foundation. And that's signed by Susan Orr, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Carol Larson, President and CEO of the Packard Foundation. Uh, and this letter mentions our sponsors. I would like to recognize uh, representatives here from the World Resources Institute who are helping us honor Walt for his contributions tonight. He was a staff person at WRI uh, during his work on the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and also the Meridian Institute, uh, who participated in the assessment and um, also admire Walt's work as we do. So for demonstrating leadership in advancing science and conservation, and for collaborating to resolve conflicts and complex policy issues, and for steering the global community towards practices that protect ecosystems and our natural heritage. We're honoring Walt Reed tonight with the 2013 Conservation Award from NatureServe. Thank you very much, Mary, for this tribute that you just gave me. I'm really deeply honored to receive this award, and I'm really grateful to NatureServe and to this community of conservation scientists and conservation practitioners for this recognition.
Um, I'm also thankful for the swag that I got yesterday when I arrived. The notion of like getting a bag that had both coffee and a right in the rain notebook. And it, it just like instantly I was transported back to waking up at four in the morning and getting the coffee, getting my right in the rain notebook and going out and doing a breeding bird survey. And it's like, you know, how many conferences could you go to where probably half the people had that same sense when they when they got that? It's like this pretty remarkable group. Um, and on that note, I think it's particularly gratifying to receive an award like this from NatureServe and at this Biodiversity Without Boundaries conference because I see the work of the people in this community as really at the foundation, at, really at the core of what I think of as science-led, science-based approaches to conservation. For conservation to see, succeed, you really do need the best science. You need science about where the species are, what the status is, the, character, the ecology of the system, the ecosystems. But you need to put that information in a form that actually can be used and is useful to decision makers. And you need the policy makers and the decision makers to be interacting in that process so that they can identify what really is useful to them. You really have to put those together. So to win in conservation, you need the best science, you need the best management, you need the best policy. But the key thing is you actually need to get them all together. Um, one of my colleagues at Packard Foundation, Kai Lee, refers to this as linking knowledge with action. That's really at the heart of successful conservation. And back in the 1970s, it was the success of this community that you represent in linking our scientific understanding of biodiversity with conservation action that really transformed conservation into this new era that we're in now of, of science-based conservation. And certainly one of the defining moments in the emergence of this um, approach to conservation had to be the establishment of the natural heritage programs back in the 1970s and, and on. Um, those programs literally put biodiversity on the map in a setting where resource managers could really make full use of the data. And the leadership of the Nature Conservancy, the, the science team that Bob Jenkins um, developed and led in, um, at, a, at that time and, and ultimately that moved on to become NatureServe, that really established the model for how we can use scientific information about biodiversity in priority setting and decision making. So when I look back, I see the 1970s and the 1980s as sort of the decades when we, we took that stab at actually bringing the basic biodiversity data and information into decision making. And then over the last 20 years, the 1990s and the 2000s, we've been starting to build on that and actually try to get more information and data about ecosystems and ecosystem services into decision making. Um, and it's in that respect, and the really why we did the Millennium Assessment, it was to try to help in, in, in bringing that basic information about how changes to ecosystems are affecting people, the data on the ecosystems and, and um, the services that they provide, trying to bring that to bear on managers and policymakers. And I have to say, I, I just can't tell you how pleased I am now looking back 10 years after the release of the assessment, that it does seem clear that the Millennium Assessment did play a, an important role in doing just that. I'm really pleased by that, and frankly, I'm also really relieved by that, um, simply because so many people devoted so much time to that effort between 2000 and, and 2005 that if it hadn't had an impact, I would have just felt enormously guilty about roping all of these people into the process. And I, a key point I want to make is, is that the, the Millennium Assessment, the MA, it really was an extraordinary group effort and involved, as Mary said, hundreds of people, more than a thousand um, people from 95 countries. And I'm deeply honored that you gave me this award, but I know that it's really also an award to all of those more than a thousand people and institutions that were involved. Um, certainly it's an award to the co-chairs of the Millennium Assessment Board, Bob Watson and A.H. Zachary and that full board. Um, it's an award to Hal Mooney and the late Angela Cropper, who were the chairs of the assessment panel. It's an award to the members of the assessment panel, to the staff of the Millennium Assessment Secretariat. Um, it's an award that recognizes two institutions that were really critical to the process. Um, both of them are sponsors tonight. Um, one, certainly World Resources Institute and its president, Jonathan Lash. WRI was really where the idea for doing the Millennium Assessment was first hatched, and it was WRI that really made it happen. They were the ones that actually got it going, got the sort of buy-in and the ownership so that it could actually take off. And then Meridian Institute was responsible for the process aspect of it 
And you can imagine a thousand scientists from 95 countries meeting in dozens of workshops and meetings around the world was an enormously challenging effort, and they, they did that flawlessly. But most of all, the award is really a recognition to the dozens of coordinating lead authors that wrote, that led chapters, the lead authors that actually did the writing, the review editors, the editorial board, the hundreds of peer reviewers, all of whom did the real work of the assessment. It was a, it was a huge effort, and, a, and I really see this an award to that entire group. Um, I'm willing to bet that very few, if anybody here, actually got roped into it, because I didn't you know the people here well enough. But I'm curious, did anybody actually get involved either as a, as a coordinating lead author, lead author, review editor? Yeah, so you're lucky. You're real lucky. <laughs> I mean, and frankly, I'm still mystified by why all those people did spend all that time sort of signing on to some new thing. Um, and I think there's a few reasons. From the start, we were trying to do something that was an effort to create something like the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity, but focused on biodiversity and ecosystems. And so I think part of it was that cachet of sort of being involved in something that could become something like an IPCC process. So that was part of it. We also had the advantage of people like Bob Watson and Jonathan Lash and Hal Mooney. And if any of you have ever run into any of them, you know they can be very persuasive. So they probably talked a lot of people into it. But most of all, I think the real reason why so many people got involved is, frankly, we misled them about how much time it was going to actually take. And it, it, it was an honest mistake. We really didn't know. We were saying, you know, we want to bring people together and do an assessment of the state of knowledge. But to do that right is an enormously time consuming. And, and people devoted a lot of time. And once they were involved and once they learned how much time it would take, um, they stayed with the process. And I think it was because of a sense that it could have an impact, but also because they found it enormously fun and interesting. And I, I found it quite fun and interesting. Part of what made it so interesting was the fact that when you do an assessment like this, an assessment of the state of knowledge globally for our issues, biodiversity and ecosystems and the impact on human well-being, I mean, that's an enormous body of knowledge. And the sort of emergent findings that come out of that really were fascinating to the scientists and social scientists involved. Um, some of those emergent findings, I think, that struck us, one, simply the extraordinarily rapid pace of change to global ecosystems. Um, in the second half of the last century, from 1950 to 2000. It was just stunning when you looked at that, the rate of, of change of land cover, the expansion of global fisheries just in a 20-year period between about 1965 and 1985. That was stunning. Um, the, the rate of ex increase in nitrogen input to global ecosystems, one of the statistics from the assessment that, that um, more, what was it, more nitrogen um, human-produced nitrogen has been put into global ecosystems between 1985 and 2000 than in the entire history up until 1985. Just, you know, these phenomenal changes in terms of our impact on the planet. Another emergent finding was just we, we really focused on the critical role of thresholds in ecosystem responses and discontinuities as being a, a real key issue, combined with the fact that it was stunning how little we actually knew scientifically about thresholds. We couldn't predict them, and we didn't even have a body of theory with which to describe or in explore thresholds and, and these discontinuities. Um, and emergent finding in terms of the importance, we certainly focused on the importance of climate change on ecosystems, but this growing threat of changes in nitrogen cycles is something that still to this day is really not given due attention. So I think that was part of what made it interesting. It was also quite interesting, although quite frustrating, to see some of the gaps in our knowledge. I, I mentioned one. Another one that was really right at the heart of the assessment is that we were looking at the consequences of ecosystem change for human well-being. We had a lot of information and studies on ecosystems and biodiversity. We had a lot of social science data on people and economies. But we had very, very little that showed how changes in ecosystems actually affected people. It was remarkable. We just assumed it would be there. And yet it was really remarkably thin, both the economic studies and other social science studies, the interdisciplinary work to fill that gap. And I think one of the most interesting parts for me and many of the other people involved was simply doing an assessment that brought together so many different disciplines. Um, we had ecologists, hydrologists, agronomists, foresters, taxonomists, economists, political scientists, ethicists. We had people from the private sector, NGOs, academia. We had indigenous people involved. It was fascinating. And at the time we did it, the whole field of ecosystem services was so new that there really wasn't a common language for talking about ecosystem services. 
and we didn't even have a shared conceptual framework for understanding how ecosystem changes affect people. And the process for developing that framework was really fascinating. It was really quite interesting. We were de dealing with different worldviews and um, different scientific traditions on basic questions like how do you actually define and categorize ecosystem services? Where do you situate humans in a framework dealing with ecosystems? Are they in or out? Are they the recipients of the changes or the drivers of changes? Do you include abiotic features of ecosystems when you think about ecosystem services? How do you deal with the ethical dimensions of conservation? Um, how do you include indigenous knowledge in a scientific assessment when indigenous communities are often the key holders of knowledge about biodiversity and ecosystems? How do you do a multi-scale assessment? It had never been done before. So there, it was fascinating dealing with that, and it really led to some of the more memorable moments for me in the process. I remember um, um, when we were trying to deal with the conceptual framework and natural scientists, we immediately start talking about drivers of change in ecosystems. It's like everybody here, you understand what a driver of change in ecosystem is, like habitat loss or climate change. Turns out, not so much with economists. They do not talk about drivers. It was completely foreign to them. And we had long debates with them about, well, how can we characterize the terminology for how people influence ecosystems if we don't use the term drivers? Another anecdote was um, in the convention on, on desertification, which needed to authorize this assessment when we were reporting the findings back to the Convention on Desertification and talking about ecosystem services, the, several of the negotiators complained and wanted us to not use the term ecosystem services because they were also negotiators in the World Trade Organization. And at that time, there was a lot of controversy over um, trade issues related to service industries, wh uh, which would be like banking services and the like. And they thought if we categorize these as ecosystem services, then they would be subject to the same trade negotiations that involve the banking sector. And so they actually, we had a long drawn out debate in the plenary session about whether we should remove the word ecosystem services from a report on ecosystem services. <laughs> and uh, the, my favorite, one of the most amusing things was actually when we developed a conceptual framework report for the assessment and um, we had a hundred people from these different disciplines, they'd met periodically over nine months, we were in the final plenary. We'd gone through the entire plenary session, going through all the chapters of the report, and everybody was basically signing off on it and had signed off on it. And then we turned to the glossary, and as we started going through the glossary, it turned out that there were fundamental disagreements on some of the terms in the glossary. And the only reason that we'd been able to agree on the text of the report is people disagreed on the terms in the glossary. So we had to iron those out and then go back around and do the report again. So. So did the Millennium Assessment had an impact? I, I'm pleased Mary said that it did. I believe it did. Um, it's interesting, as I said, looking back now and seeing some of that impact. What's interesting to me is I think the, the primary impact of the Millennium Assessment was really at this conceptual level. And that wasn't really necessarily what we were thinking, but it was at that level of framing the issue and, and defining ecosystem services. Um, it had a surprising impact on an audience that we didn't really see as an audience. We weren't doing this for the scientific community, but it really did have an impact on the scientific community. And I think the reason why was that there were certainly researchers who were working on ecosystems, ecosystem services, and interdisciplinary work with the social scientists, but it was not really seen as a, a mainstream area of work. It was a bit on the margins. And so the Millennium Assessment suddenly validated that as an area of work and gave it a great deal of legitimacy and identified some of the key research needs. And so I think it was able to bolster a part of the scientific community in a way that then they've been able to continue on with and, and really have a, an enormous impact in that area. Really, the, the key audience for the assessment, though, were the decision makers, policy makers, managers. And there, the primary impact of the Millennium Assessment, I think, was demonstrating and validating the fact that conservation wasn't just about protecting biodiversity from people. Because many people in the development community, even though I don't think we see it that way, many people still saw it as, well, it's that thing on the margin where you're protecting biodiversity from people. The, the Millennium Assessment really demonstrated the point that it's also about maintaining the ability of ecosystems to enhance human well-being. And in this respect, I think the Millennium Assessment helped to make biodiversity and ecosystems much more of a mainstream concern in economic development planning where the issues really belong. The issues we're concerned about, how we manage ecosystems, how we produce food, how we maintain clean water, how we sequester carbon, 
how we maintain biodiversity, those are issues that really should be right at the heart of the economic and development agenda, and the Millennium Assessment helped to, to demonstrate that and validate that. So let me give a few examples of um, giving some evidence for this mainstreaming of these issues. Um, first, the pr one of the primary reasons to do the Millennium Assessment was to create something like the IPCC, an ongoing assessment process. And that, um, just last year, finally, after a long period of negotiation, that was established. It's called the Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It's modeled strongly after the Millennium Assessment. The person who chaired the negotiation was Bob Watson, who was the chair of the Millennium Assessment. And it certainly was able to get where it was in terms of creating that intergovernmental process thanks to the Millennium Assessment. So there I think we can sort of have a direct line of impact. The other things I'll mention, certainly the Millennium Assessment helped to move this issue forward, but there's many other factors that have led to some of these other examples of where, of where ecosystem service issues are increasingly mainstreamed. First, um, within the NGO community, um, organizations like Nature Conservancy and CI and others that traditionally were narrowly focused on biodiversity have now expanded their mandate to look at biodiversity ecosystem services and that link with people. I know there's some concern that they may have gone a bit too far. Um, I actually don't think so. I think at the, the heart, they're sort of concerned about that spectrum of issues, but they realize that if you don't ultimately link this to human needs, then the, the power that you need to actually protect the whole array of biodiversity and ecosystems really won't be there. Another example um, that I'm quite impressed with, the Natural Capital Project. It's a collaborative effort between Stanford, WWF, Nature Conservancy, and University of Minnesota. It's now involved in dozens of projects around the world where they're mapping flows of ecosystem services and calculating the economic values of those flows, and they're doing it in response to requests from decision makers around the world for that information. Um, here in the United States, certainly the, the federal agencies and state agencies, they've been focused on ecosystem management, increasingly using ecosystem service tools and the language in their work, um, Forest Service, EPA, and others. Many, several, well, I shouldn't say many, several countries like the UK, um, the European Union, Mexico have carried out ecosystem service assessments modeled on the MA, and those have been done also at subnational levels. There are now dozens of water funds in Latin America where downstream users of water pay upstream landowners to conserve that land for the ecosystem service that's being provided. And my favorite example, um, starting this year, after a flood or a storm causes a lot of damage and FEMA steps in to bail out people that have lost property, starting this year, what FEMA's first going to do is calculate the economic value of not rebuilding that house or not rebuilding that road. So if by leaving, yes. <laughs> so if by leaving that potential wetland in its natural state, the economic benefit provided in its natural state is greater than it's sticking a road through there, they won't pay to have it rebuilt. They'll make sure it's built somewhere else. And you think about that, I mean, that's all of a sudden steering a billion dollars or more in, in the the type of funds that go into the rebuilding. So I think that's been real progress. Our, the issues that we work on, biodiversity, ecosystems, ecosystem services, are now being far better addressed in policy and management decision making than ever before. And as a result, the potential for ongoing work of, of this community to bring conservation science into these decision making processes is greater than ever before. But as significant as this progress is, we all know that that's hardly sufficient. Um, improved decision making about ecosystems and biodiversity is, is obviously critical, but when you're faced with sort of major drivers of change, of global change that really can overwhelm any of our conservation gains, we really know it's not sufficient. And the two big drivers of change um, that we're all incredibly sensitive to, one is certainly climate change. Um, you look back over the last five years, we've so many things that in theory should have brought down emissions. We had a global recession that dropped economic output of countries around the world, expanded solar and wind energy. Here in the United States, we've had a fundamental transformation in the baseload energy supply in the U.S. from coal shifting dramatically to natural gas, which is much less um, potent as a source of greenhouse gases. And yet with all of that, globally, the emissions trajectory that we're on right now tracks the highest emission trajectory of the IPCC trajectories from 2006. So we haven't made any progress. We're still on that sort of worst case 
scenario from those scenarios. So we, at this point, you know, just between us scientists, we really have no chance of meeting the 450 part per million target or the two degree threshold. We're just not gonna do that. And so we're facing, from a biodiversity standpoint, massive impacts on these systems from climate change. The second big driver, food security, um, or the expansion of agriculture. We need to double food production by 2050 to meet the demands of the growing population, nine billion people. We need to do that in the face of climate change. And importantly, we need to do that without any further expansion of agriculture, which of course has been part of how we've managed to increase agricultural production. But if we expand agriculture, we lead to more loss of forests. Already agriculture and forests are a source of one quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to stop that expansion of agriculture and we have to reduce emissions associated with agriculture. A massive challenge, and if we don't get that right, and we see broader expansion of agriculture, then the impacts on biodiversity and climate will be severe. So those two problems that we need to solve, climate change and food security, are really critical. And I see, for our community, this nexus of forests, agriculture, and climate, with all of the biodiversity that we have there in the forest and agriculture community, that nexus of those three issues is really the most important thing as I look forward over the next two decades in terms of trying to solve these problems. I see the, the holy grail for us right now is to figure out how we can increase agricultural productivity without more expansion of agriculture into natural habitats, particularly peat soils in Indonesia, which are a big problem, and do that in a way that's reducing greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. And if we can do that, then we've dealt with a quarter of the climate problem, since a quarter of the emissions are from agriculture, We've dealt with the fundamental human problem of actually feeding the planet and the impacts for saving biodiversity, if we can do that without further expansion of agriculture, will be profound. In my view, this community broadly, looking globally, is going to be at the heart of solving that problem too, because it fundamentally needs expertise in science about biodiversity, ecosystems, and ecosystem services to set priorities and to identify how to solve those problems. Now, I, I don't consider myself at all an optimist on issues related to climate change or food security. But I have to say that my role now at the Packard Foundation has brought me in touch with a lot of scientists, NGOs, um, people in the private sector and governments who've actually given me a great deal of hope about the potential for innovative solutions to address problems like, like those. Um, just three examples. 20 years ago, I was in Rio de Janeiro at the Earth Summit. And at that time in Brazil, the prospects for slowing deforestation in Brazil seemed really remote. It seemed like a pretty insoluble challenge. And for the next decade after that, from 1992 to, to 2002, there was no progress. Deforestation rates went up. Since 2004, deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon has dropped by 80%, 80%. I mean, it's been a stunning turnaround, just a remarkable success in that period of time. Another example, 20 years ago, around the same time, federal fisheries in the United States were severely in trouble. I mean, they were extremely poorly managed. The, the management councils would routinely ignore the guidance from scientists, set harvest levels too high, and fisheries were collapsing in the United States. Last year, NOAA announced that federal fisheries in the United States are no longer overfished. Many of those stocks are now rebuilding, and the ones that are... Um, the, where we have the harvest data, the, the fishing level has dropped so that they're no longer overfished. A third example, 20 years ago, in most developing countries, local communities in both forested systems and in coastal systems were basically losing their rights to resources, and those coastal resources and forest resources were being degraded dramatically. Now you look at countries in Central America, in Chile, in the Western Pacific, even some places in Africa, where there's been a restoration of local community rights and ownership of those resources, where the communities are now benefiting, protecting those resources, and managing them sustainably. So I see these problems of climate change, food security, meeting the growing population's need as really immense problems, but I fundamentally believe that they, they can be addressed. So in closing, I want to recognize the fact that your work on conservation science, conservation management, your work in protecting biodiversity and ecosystem services really could not be more important for the future, not just of biodiversity and ecosystems, but really for the future of humanity. You may have seen the other day the announcement 
of the Human Brain Initiative, a 10-year project that will cost at least a billion dollars to map the brain. This follows on the Human Genome Project, a $4 billion effort to map the human genome. I think the reality is that since 1970, organizations like the Natural Heritage Programs, NatureServe, the government and academic researchers um, that are here have been carrying out what might be called the Human Ecosystem Project, a multi-decade initiative to map and understand the biodiversity and ecosystems that maintain human life. The only real difference here is that you don't have the billions of dollars that these other things do, and you don't have the president standing up there endorsing it. But the work you're doing is really extraordinarily important for biodiversity and human well-being. And I thank you for recognizing my small contribution. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to have you here. Thanks so much for your words and your, your words of encouragement to us. Um, I know we really appreciate that because uh, coming together as we do each year to talk about all the issues, a lot of it is devoted to the great work that we're doing, but a lot of it is devoted to the challenges that we face, and, and it's great to know that uh, our work is appreciated and, and we can reflect that back and show you how much you've influenced our work. So thanks. That's it for this evening's presentation. Enjoy the rest of your evening.